Nico, who are you? Nikos. Yeah. Yes. Um, will someone give me a sign, a signal, or I start whenever I want? Yeah, it's a signal. <laughs> <laughs> are you sure? Yeah, we got that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so welcome to this tutorial. Um, I, I hope it will be interesting for you. Um, this is the first time I gave such a tutorial, so I warn you, it may not be the perfect one. So sometimes when you give a tutorial a number of times and you correct mistakes, I, have, I think this one has a number of mistakes. The first one is that it has 160 slides, and I think it will be impossible to go through all of them. Uh, but you know, when someone tells you, oh, you have three hours or four hours to talk, then you start putting this stuff, and then, okay, uh, that's the first mistake. The first thing I would like to say is that this is not just my work, of course. I mean, this is something done in collaboration with a number of colleagues uh, from many places. John Debenham, who unfortunately passed away last year uh, in Australia. Patricia Gutierrez, who is a collaborator in my institute uh, from Cuba, and Nardine Osman from Lebanon. Uh, and many others. I mean, there are engineers that uh, have participated in some of these developments. This corresponds to the part of the tutorial in which I will explain you my position in trust, in which I will explain you what I have been doing and the uh, methods that I have used. Uh, I will uh, start with uh, some motivation of why trust is important. Uh, and I hope you will, uh, you will think so and, and you will uh, get motivated to, uh, to work on, on this exciting field. I will give you some algorithms uh, as a warming up. In particular, I will mention three, Aiken Trust, Tidal Trust and Regret, that are quite different in, in the way they understand trust. Um, I will give you some details of each one of them. And then I will go into explaining you um, a concept, information-based agency, which is understanding agents as kind of information processing machines. Um, uh, I will give you some background, the minimum background needed to understand then uh, a number of uh, algorithms and applications that you have here in a list. So each one of these uh, trust models, you see their names, trusted opinion and so on, they are motivated by some particular application that some problem to be solved that you see after the end on each one of these lines. Um, I don't know if I will get through all of them, but each one of them is quite, I would say, independent of each other. So if time runs out, then we will stop where we will be. And then you can always have a look at these slides, and if you have questions, uh, then I will be happy to answer them offline through email. Um, and then conclusions, okay? Okay, let's hope that this works okay. So trust. There is a sentence by uh, this kind of uh, philosopher, Nicholas Luhmann, in 79, that said, a complete absence of trust would prevent even getting up in the morning. So we use trust every day in the sense that we don't expect the lift to break and fall. We don't expect to be hit by a car when we get out of, of our house. So we really use trust in, on our everyday activities. We trust what the others will do, we trust what the systems around us will be, will be doing. So there are two definitions uh, that I like, uh, because they, 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 um, I think they focus on, on, on the character of what trust is. So the first one by Luhmann in 79 says that trust begins where knowledge, certainty ends. So trust provides as a basis dealing with uncertain, complex, and threatening images of the future. So it's about foreseeing what will happen, thinking what can happen next, what can happen next week. And then we use trust as kind of assessing uh, that uh, um, kind of state of the world for which we don't have certainty. We are not sure whether that will be the case or not. So uncertainty is fundamental in trust. The second one um, is um, kind of the outcome of observing um, uh, what the others do in order that we can come to the belief of the result of the actions of others. So the question is whether we can rely upon what the actions of the others will do without an explicit guarantee in order to achieve a goal. 
So it's related to uh, more a kind of an epistemic thing, like a belief of what the others are going to do and whether we can rely on them. So it's relying upon the others, the important uh, concept behind trust. So there are two, two views. I mean, trust thought as an epistemic concept or as a motivational concept. From an epistemic perspective, uh, Gambetta uh, said that it is the subjective probability by which an individual, A, expects that another individual, B, performs a given action on which its welfare depends. So I need you to do something, and this is important for me, uh, and my, my trust on you is a kind of subjective probability of whether you're going to do that or you're not going to do that. If I don't trust you, it means that I don't expect you to do that, and therefore my welfare may suffer. If I trust you, then I can be uh, uh, certain, to a certain extent, happy that my welfare will be okay. Marsh reduced that into an even shorter expression, so uh, trust is an expectation about an uncertain behavior. I sign a contract with you, then you execute the contract, and I'm uncertain about whether you're going to do what you said you would do in your contract. But I have an expectation, and that's my trust in you. If I have a high trust on you, my expectation is high that you are going to fulfill the terms of the contract we already signed. So it's an, an epistemic concept. It's about expectations, knowledge about what will happen, belief of what will happen. On the other hand, some philosophers think of it as a motivational concept. Um, in the sense of trust is basically a decision and the act of relying on someone else. So when I trust you, is that I, I, my, my motivational element is that I believe, I, no, it's not a belief, it's I rely, I, I, I decide to rely on your actions. In order to, I trust you, so I rely that you're going to do what you said you would do. I count on you, I depend on you, I depend on the other guy to do something. So these are kind of the two approaches to trust. One is more on the expectation side, the other one is on the re relying on side. Very much related to trust, and we will see that in some of the later slides, uh, but also is sometimes confused uh, with trust. So reputation definition could be is, is what a social entity says about a target regarding his or her behavior. So is the behavior going to be honorable? So is, the, is, the, is that site reliable in terms of the content? Is that guy going to fulfill the terms of the contract? And it's not said by an individual, but it's said by some kind of social organization. So it is uh, eBay who said that, or is Amazon who says that. Um, reputation is usually one of the elements that allows us to build trust. If you go to I don't know, one of these sites for hotels, for booking hotels. I mean, you usually go to the command that everybody has given, and you have some stars there telling you how reputable is that particular hotel. And this gives you trust on the hotel. You, you have an expectation that you're going to have similar experience of those that gave commands to that hotel. So reputation is usually one of the key elements when you build trust on someone or on something. But it, it also has a social dimension, reputation. It's not only useful for an individual, but also for the society as a mechanism for social order. So when someone has a very bad reputation, and this is publicly known, I mean, this hotel will probably react in order to change the way they do things. So this is a kind of a feedback of society into people, into institutions, so that they can change the way they do things, so that overall, the, um, uh, the system changes for better. So it's a mechanism for social order. So there are two, two, these are two interesting aspects of what reputation uh, is. In terms of trust, and we will see that in, in the models we're going to talk about, hi Pavlos, uh, next. Um, trust can be thought of being, um, of having to, um, or, or you can classify, let's say, trust models into two big uh, groups. The first one is global trust, which is actually reputation. But some people call it global trust. Here, the trust values are maintained as a centralized resource. So there is some institution, some organization that keeps the values. 
So all the agents have access to the same values. So the trust to a particular hotel is kept by someone, I go there, I check what the value is, everybody has the same uh, possibility to get that information. But there are a number of advantages of global trust uh, mechanisms. So this information is available even if you come to the, this particular society as a newcomer. So you're new there, you don't know anybody. If you have this global trust, then okay. It doesn't depend on whether I know the people or I, don't, or I know the hotels or whatever, I have that information. So agents somehow can be simpler when, because you don't need to calculate trust values, just use them. You just go there, consult them, and use them to take your decisions. So this is really a clear advantage. Well, as a disadvantage is that the mental state of the agent, it being it a human being or being it a software, or the particular situation and needs in a particular moment are not taken into account. So everything is contextless. So no context, uh, individual context uh, uh, is taken into account. So a global view is usually possible in these situations when we assume that all the agents think and behave similarly. In that case, global trust can work, but otherwise there are many drawbacks on that. There is another issue with uh, global trust is that it's not always good for an agent to make information about its experiences public. So sometimes I don't want to tell whether a particular experience with a hotel or with a customer was good or bad. Um, in the global trust, this relies on everybody kind of telling what their experiences were. So uh, there is a need uh, on, as well uh, on trusting the institution that is managing the reputation. So you need to trust the guys that are keeping that information not to lie to you, not to kind of change the trust values. You always have this idea, oh my god, I mean, are, uh, can I be sure that this is really the truth? So you need a high trust on, on, on that. As examples of global trust, you can see eBay, I will not talk about that, but eBay you all know. I mean, it's people saying uh, my experience was good, my experience was bad, and basically it's an average of what these experiences are. Uh, Aiken Trust, I will explain that a bit in detail, uh, is based more on the opinions of individuals about each other. But in both cases, you come out with a global trust measure. A particular individual has this level of trust, and everybody has access to that value. Local trust, on the other hand, is uh, uh, are models in which the trust values are maintained by each agent. And they are calculated according to their individual experiences. They can use all sorts of information from their contacts. So if I trust someone a lot and, and that guy passes me information, I can use that to compute my own thinking on a particular guy or a particular uh, resource, okay? But uh, the, um, the uh, basics of these models is that the computation come from direct experiences of individuals and are kept uh, in a local way. So the advantages are, well, the disadvantages on the other one way, in a sense. I mean, reputation values can be calculated taking into account the current state of the agent and its individual particularity. So if I go to buy meat to a butcher, I may be very, very satisfied with the quality of the meat, but someone else can go buy the same meat and not be satisfied with that uh, meat. So because people are think differently, and people perceive differently the environment. So the disadvantage is that these models are usually more complex. Um, they usually need to take extra sources of information because, of course, if it is direct experiences at the beginning, I don't know nothing about, about another guy, so I need to somehow get some information from somewhere until I get my direct experiences working. So usually um, uh, less information is available uh, in this model, so you need to take uh, the maximum amount of the available information. So we'll see tidal trust and regret as two models, existing models, and then I will speak a bit about the probabilistic models uh, in the second part of the, of the tutorial. Okay. So, um, uh, I hope the notion of trust is more or less clear, how it is understood in the literature. So let, let's go into uh, three models, Egan Trust, Tidal Trust, and Regret. And, uh, well, I will explain them in simple terms. I mean, each one of them, of course, can be you can go to the literature and then go into more details, of course. It will give you the idea of, of these models. Uh, and of course, if there is something you don't understand, uh, then please question me, because 
again, as I said, it's the first time I'm explaining this stuff, so I'm not sure if I will pass the information in the correct way to you. Okay, Eigen Trust. So Eigen Trust appeared um, on a file sharing context. As you know, the peer to peer systems appeared uh, uh, kind of 10, 15 years ago for people that wanted to uh, share files. It could be videos, it could be uh, images, it could be music tracks, it could be many things. So the question that appeared very soon is how can you protect users from malicious peers that would introduce, for instance, viruses into your system when downloading a file or inappropriate content. So you wanted a video on a picture and the picture that appeared was not the one that you were expecting. So how can you protect the users of such applications? Okay, what Eigen Trust does is to associate a simple global trust, so it's one of the examples of global trust, to each peer based on the experiences of all peers. So what it does, it summarizes the experiences of everybody into a single trust value. And they set up five requirements for the system to work that you can, you can see here. Oh, I don't want that. First one is self-policy. So they wanted people to kind of determine the values by their own working, by their workings and interactions they had, and by passing information among themselves. It wanted to keep anonymity of people. So I pass you information about my experience, but I want still to be hidden. I don't want to be identified. I don't want anyone to find my IP address. I will use some name uh, and uh, that is a fake name and that will keep my anonymity. There should be no profit for newcomers because, I mean, you could imagine a system in which basically you, 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 cor you have corrupted files, you have viruses, everything, so your reputation goes down and then you change your nickname, then you appear again in the society and then you have a high reputation again and then you start doing the same thing. So there should be no profit for newcomers. So newcomers will have to build up their reputation, will need to build up their trust from the bottom. So there is no incentive for someone to change identities. It should have minimal overhead. I mean, it should be a system in which you should not uh, kind of spend all your time exchanging messages among each other so that it, it creates a burden on the, on the uh, participants. Uh, of those using Eigen Trust. And it should be robust to malicious collectives because some, of course, if we are a collective of malicious peers, we can just rate each other very high so that we become a kind of a clique, a subgraph of the society with very high values. But actually, we are very bad uh, peers, so we need to protect somehow against this situation. So Eigen Trust manages to somehow fit all these requirements. And I will tell you a bit about uh, how it works um, to see uh, that that is the case. So the transactions in Eigen Trust are evaluated as in eBay. So when there is a transaction between two agents, I and J, so you rate it as either negative or positive. You just say it was minus one or one. This is already a limitation of all these systems. I mean, we, can, we will see later on that this is this can be uh, easily improved by, by rating in a much more graded way. But transactions in this case are just binary, minus one over one. So you can easily compute a local trust value by just adding up them all. Okay? So you, I had a number of experiences with someone. Uh, some of them were one, some of them were minus one. I add them up and I have um, a value. That value, of course, can be as large as you can imagine because if I had many interactions and the number will be very big or, or it will be zero because there were some were positive some were negative yeah i trust j so that's the uh, i and j so this means tr means transactions a, a particular transaction between i and j between i and j and if it's one then that means that i trust that i was extremely happy, happy with j if it is minus one it means that i was not happy with j that is what it means and this is recorded by i is I. I is the one keeping these locally there and keeping my, my. And then I can add up that to give a number. My trust on you, my local trust is 25. Does it mean we interacted 25 times? No. It means we interacted a number of times, but overall, when you add them up, you are on the positive side and you have 25. So that's how it works. So the question is how to aggregate all these local uh, kind of local trust values. So we have all local trust values about each other. 
So how can we aggregate that into a global trust value about someone? It doesn't seem easy uh, on the first hand. You will see that they find a, a clever solution. And we would like to do that with a, without a central server. We are going to show, I will show you the algorithm with a central server, but they, they have a distributed algorithm uh, that is a bit more complicated. It will take longer, so we will not go into that. But they have a solution with, without a central server. So other systems before Eigentrust, they would just aggregate only a few values, or they would have a large overhead of messages between the different partners, and they somehow fix that uh, from a computational perspective. So the idea they, they have is transitive trust. What does it mean? Is what it said here. I trust the opinions of those I trust in providing files. OK, we are making a link here. I mean, you're pro providing me good files. Then it will say, OK, if you tell me something about another guy, I will also trust you, because you provided me with good uh, files in the past. OK, this is the, the idea. And mathematically, the global trust is uh, uh, the left eigenvector of a matrix of normalized local trust values. I will just tell you uh, how the mathematics of that work uh, next. Um, but before that, um, there is the need to normalize trust. Because numbers don't mean anything by themselves, because it can be any number. I mean, we need to um, kind of uh, avoid the overrating of malicious peers that they can make. So what, what these guys do is they define this normalized trust, as you see here. Basically, every individual takes, uh, they start with zero. That way they maximize the negative numbers. They don't care. So they start from zero. And they take uh, the value, 25. 37 um, uh, of a particular uh, uh, interest, um, opinion about another guy. And you divide that by the maximum, the summation of the maximum of everybody. So everything becomes a number between 0 and 1. Okay? So you normalize the um, local trust into values between 0 and 1. Well, this normalization has two problems. The first is that it doesn't distinguish the opinion of someone without any interactions. If I have no interactions, then I will have a zero. I will have a, I will, I never interacted with you, then the uh, confidence of the C, I, J will be zero. Or someone with bad interactions with J. So if they had bad interactions with you, it would be a negative number. So the maximum will always be zero. So I cannot distinguish between these two zeros. That's one problem. The second is that the absolute value has no meaning. So if I have in the end 0 0.5 or 0 0.7, that doesn't mean much. The only thing, uh, because it can come from very different uh, numbers, so the only thing I can say is that if someone has 0 0.7 and someone uh, has 0 0.7, they're equally trustworthy, trust, trust, uh, trust, uh, trusted uh, sides. Never mind, the results are still fine, uh, as they prove in their experiments. OK, so we normalize these um, things. So the idea of the transitive um, trust is aggregating values in the following sense. So you have the equation at the top. This would be the trust that um, I has on K. And this trust is basically uh, the summation of the paths through your friends that go to that guy. So you have a C sub I J, which is my trust on someone J, and C sub J, K, which is the trust that that guy has on K. So we multiply those values, and we add up for all my friends. Okay, That gives me a trust value. So which is how much do I trust that guy through the chain of trust of my friends, so my friends' opinions about um, that guy. As I said, that was the initial idea, is the transitive trust in, in the model. So what these guys do is, OK, let's compute the matrix C. Matrix C contains all the normalized values, as you see here, the CIJs, for everybody in the society. So you get all these CIJs. You put them into a matrix. And then you do the following. You imagine the vector T sub i okay, is the vector of all the trans values that i has on k. Okay. How can you then compute uh, the, uh, the trans values of all that vector? It's very simple. You take the matrix of the C, you make it, you transpose it, and you multiply 
by your initial trust on those guys. So you have your CI, I trust on those guys. I multiply that by uh, the matrix, and then I will use my friends' trust on those, multiplying them and adding them up. So this is a, a, a matrix representation of what we have at the top. So for instance, for agent number one, you will have something like the TI for agent one will be basically uh, the uh, trust I have on everybody multiplied by what those people have as trust on that one, okay? So I'm just using my friends for one. And I'm doing that for all the, all the, uh, all the agents in the system. Okay, that's fine. So you, if you have the matrix C and you have your initial uh, trust confidence on the others, then I can compute the trust on them using my friends. But then you can use also your friends' friends' opinions. You can have a chain in which you, only, you also trust what your friends' friends think about that guy. And this corresponds to applying the uh, matrix twice to your initial vector. But you can do it three times, or four times, or n times. So you can use all the paths that go from uh, myself to a particular target in order to uh, reach the, um, uh, the final trust. So this is the basic algorithm, the, the most simple algorithm of A and trust. What you do is, of course, what is my C sub i? I can start with some equiparable thing, like 1 divided by m. If we are in a society of m agents, I take 1 divided by m. So ignorance. I don't know how the other is behind. Uh, I, 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 I take that as the initial vector t. And then what I do is I keep um, adding, I keep applying the matrix of the C uh, to that vector um, and uh, until I reach here, until I reach, oops, uh, delta is more than a certain epsilon until the difference that I get from one step to the next is small enough. So these, they prove that the algorithm converges um, um, in all settings, uh, starting with this one divided by m. There are some problems with that, and usually the results are good enough, uh, usually applying four or five times these process, with four or five times in the experiments they have done on Egan Trust, it works pretty well. So it's very simple to program. The only thing you need, of course, to do is to pass uh, the information, the local information, to uh, a central server, in this case, where you compute the matrix C, then you compute the thing, and then you generate the final vector t that has the trust on every member of the society. And then that vector is the one that can be con consulted by people. So every time there is a change on your experiences, you communicate the new value, then you recompute um, the um, thing. There are problems here. I mean, um, usually this method is not protected against malicious peers, as the claim was in the beginning. So what, what these guys do is there should be a, some sort of a priori notion of trust. And in many cases, these peer-to-peer -peer systems, they start with a, a group of trusted peers, P. And this group of trusted peers are those that create the infrastructure, usually. Um, and basically what they propose is to have a um, probability distribution that is for those that are part of this subgroup of members, you assign one divided by the number of peers, okay? You have some initial trust or default trust in those. And for the rest, you start with zero, okay? And then instead of using, uh, uh, as you will see in this equation, instead of using the C sub i in the equations, you're going to use that vector p. The reason another problem with the algorithm before is that in active peers, the function will be undefined. This function is undefined if you have an, an inactive peer, someone that doesn't have any, well, it is defined to be undefined because you don't have any Sij without any interaction with the value of Sij. Sij was the result of a summation of experiences. If I have no experiences, this is not defined. So what they suggest uh, is to define Cij, so the uh, local trust resulting from my transactions, um, um, as the maximum as we saw before, if we have the summation of this maximum uh, zero, 
so that we don't have the, uh, this quotient, this division defined. Uh, or, in case the, uh, the, there, is no, there are no interactions, we use the vector P sub J. So if the maximum is zero, this is undefined, okay? You're going to divide by zero, so you don't have a, a definition here. If it is the case that you define PJ, which is the, uh, the initial, so the probability that this is a trusted peer from default, if it is one of the initial peers, it will be uh, whatever, one divided by P. If it is not one of the initial ones, it will be zero. But you will have CIJ defined always. So the matrix will have values at all points. Then the other thing they do is to avoid malicious collectives. They say, in order not to get stuck with a group of malicious peers that will kind of rate each other very highly, you're going to use a trick, which is when you update your trans vector, you not only take into account my friend, friend's opinions, but I also take always a bit into account the default probability. So I always take I have the opportunity of getting out of that group because there will be some probability for those that are trusted, not for those that are going to be malicious and increase their trust there. So the probability of getting a stack into a group malicious peers gets reduced. It's not avoided, but I mean it, it gets reduced. So that leads for the, um, the basic Aiken trust algorithm, which is this one. So basically you start with a set of initial peers, those that are trusted, you define the probability in P. You have a, a parameter, A, as smaller than 1, that will determine the balance between my friend's, friend's, friend's opinions and the default uh, trans value. And you proceed like you see in this, in this equation. So initially you start with this default P, and then you obtain, as before, the new vector. But then this new vector gets modified by uh, having an interpolation between uh, it and the default one. And again, you do the same until you finish uh, with a small uh, error in the system. So this is the basic one. You could implement that in 20 minutes, and that will give you an Eigen trust uh, algorithm that basically uh, is a global one. Uh, in this version, it is centralized, and it respects to a large extent the requirements that I said at the beginning. There are other improvements in, in the basic Eigen trust algorithm, because what you can do is you can compute um, the, one of the elements of the vector uh, locally. So you can have a distributed version of this algorithm that does not require that uh, there is a central server. And the only thing you will need is communication among the agents on the calculation of the trust among them. You can find that uh, in several papers if you are interested in So this is an example of global trust. It is based on each one gathering information about the interaction with others, passing that to a central server where you have this matrix and this computation will converge into the trust values of everyone. Okay? Eigen trust. Tidal trust. Tidal trust is um, a kind of uh, uh, moving into the local computation. So they, there is a critic on peer-to-peer -peer systems because they don't distinguish, as we said before, I mean the behavior of individuals in a social context. And we all know that the peer is good or bad depending on whom it is interacting with. If you're interacting with your wife or your husband, they will be nice to you normally. Uh, but if you're interacting with someone you don't know, I mean, you cannot assume that. If you're interacting with a competitor company in a negotiation setting, they are not necessarily going to be good for you, with you. So, so the context determines um, how people behave according to um, whom they are interacting with. So in a sense, the peer-to-peer -peer system um, um, approach of Hagen Trust is not probably appropriate for social systems of the like that we want to have. Okay, so what does Tidal Trust do? Um, it's, it's a bit more complicated algorithm. So what it does, it, it looks into the trust values along the paths connecting the source and the sink. So the sink is the guy I want to assess the trust for, okay? And I am the source. So I want to know my trust on Georgios. Okay. So of course there is a social uh, graph that connects people with each other. And we can imagine you have transactions and you have a similar local opinion on each other. <clears throat> what it does, it goes through this graph, 
but limiting the depth of the paths. In, in the previous one, in eigentrust, you would apply that until you would converge. You would not care of how many friends or friends or friends or friends you're going to use. Here, you want to limit that, because there is an understanding that two long chains of trust, in a sense, are not good, because in, you're using so many people in between that, I mean, the idea of the accuracy in the end of what you're going to get is not going to be good. You would like to limit. So the shorter, the better. Um, so it, it basically looks for that. It looks for the shortest search path that will produce a result, that would give you a value of trust on that guy. Okay. It also considers the best paths. So you can have a path connecting me with Georgius through some people, and the values in that path may be very low. So when I will going to compute the aggregated trust through that path through multiplication, I will do the multiplication of the values, that will get very low. So I don't want to use that very low path trust into my computation. So it, 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 uses, uh, it, it uses the highest rankings and ignore the low rating paths. So to do that, it uses a variable in the algorithm that determines the largest threshold that can be established for trust that does not preclude finding the rating. So what you want is to find the rating using the shortest paths possible and using from those the best ones. Um, this is basically the equation of the algorithm, and, and, and there is a description. I don't have an algorithmic description of tidal trust, but by reading it, I hope you are going to get it. So what it does is the following. So the trust of uh, me into the sink uh, will do the, uh, the following thing. So it will, on the top, you have a summation for all my adjusting nodes, so all my friends. Okay. Um, and I will compute the multiplication of my trust on my friend times the trust of my friend on the sink. Okay. And I will do that, and this is important, the condition, only if the trust I have on my friend is bigger than a certain threshold, max. If I, my trust on a friend is under max, I will not use that. Okay, I will not use that friend. So you basically multiply that, but of course, I mean, my friend, what's the trust of my friend on the sink? If my friend has already interacted with the sink and has direct experiences, as we saw before in the case of eigentrust, that's the value that the guy will give back. That's my experience with that guy. That's my trust on that guy. If he didn't, he would continue search. So he will apply the same equation to try and find its value, its trust value on the sink. So it becomes a kind of a search. So I, I, I ask my friend, my friend either answers or continues searching with each friend, and those continue and continue. So the idea is that in this search, every, uh, every node <coughs> will know the depth that they are computing. And um, uh, it is a breadth first search. So as soon as we find the value, by finding a value, uh, uh, to the, uh, it, it means we find someone that had already direct experiences to that guy. So when we find the value, then we limit the depth of the search to the length of that path. And we start computing the maximum values. So kind of, uh, we start setting the value of the max. Uh, we continue search. When we find better paths, we increase the value so that we always find the path that will give a value with the maximum uh, result. And when we finish the search, then we finish the computation. So when the, the, the search is complete, the subtree is generated, then the value of the max variable is set. And at that moment, you fold back the algorithm, and then you compute the values up to the end. So it's a kind of a <clears throat> search setting or searching for the parameters that then will be used in the overall computation. So this is tidal trust. This kind of a tidal in the sense of a wave. I mean. You, you make a wave searching, and then you, you come back by computing the values um, uh, as a result. Okay? So in this case, this is a local trust. So this trust is my trust on someone using my network of friends. If someone else computes the same uh, trust, it will have a different value. So it will be a completely local uh, value for each node. Okay? So this is tidal trust.
Now, I will show you another one called Regret. And this is a bit more inspired in, uh, how to say that, in, in social networks uh, than the two previous ones. In the two previous ones, uh, there are many things that are not taken into account. Uh, we do not take into account the social relationship between the nodes, for instance. Are they friends? Do they hate each other? Uh, we don't take into account uh, time, so when those experiences happened. We didn't in Egan Trust as well. So there are a number of things that uh, are uh, ignored there that this model tries to take into account. This was um, is, uh, thought as a, as a modular system, and it was applied to e-commerce environments where the social relationships are very important. Um, this is the um, kind of a diagram of what the system is. And um, by the way, anyone knows when is lunch? Um, 12 45. 12 45? Okay. <clears throat> so you see here a number of boxes, okay? And then you see there is a box reputation model pointing towards trust. So this model. <coughs> Builds up a reputation of uh, of someone and uses that as the basis for trust, and combines that so reputation in the sense of what the others think about a certain guy. It combines that with direct trust, which is my direct experiences, and it does combine it in a in a sophisticated well, in a it's not that sophisticated in a in a single way, I would say in which if I have direct trust on someone, so I interacted with Georgius, and I know how Georgius be behaves, then I will take that information as my trust on him. I don't listen to anybody. But if I'm a newcomer, or if I didn't have a lot of interactions with Georgius, then I will use the information that comes from my social network as a reputation to give me an initial trust on him to decide whether I want to interact with him or not. Because don't forget that trust measures are um, values that help uh, people and help the system to take decisions on what to do. I mean, trust is why trust? Because we want to sign a contract with someone. We want to download a file from someone. So we need to decide how do we rank uh, sites, how do we rank people, in order to decide what to do with them. Okay, so trust can be coming from these two sources. And so this model is interesting because it exploits a lot, in the reputation model, it exploits a lot the social network. Um, and as, as we will see in a, in, a, in a moment. Okay, so the witness reputation. The witness reputation is based on what witnesses tell me about others. By witnesses here, uh, we think of uh, other agents that had some experience with those guys. So if I'm talking about uh, my trust on Georgios, I may like to ask people that interacted with Georgios, what's your opinion about him? And then I will combine that in a particular way, similarly to what we did before. The thing before is that we were kind of using searching for the connection with Georgios. Okay. Here, we're going to use the social network knowledge that we have to see whether we know who interacted with Georgios. You will see that. What's the problem of the witness? If I ask someone that hates Georgios, then he may lie. So he can tell me wrong things about Georgios. Georgios, is, is right the name? Georgios, okay. Um, it can be incomplete. People may not answer me. I may not have access to witnesses. And it may suffer from the correlated evidence problem, which is something that is a problem in all the previous models, in the sense that if guys interact with Georgios and they are friends of each other and they pass information among themselves, they may just come out with a similar opinion on Georgios. So there will be some correlation on the opinions they have. And that's a problem, because we would like to uh, use independent sources of information to uh, find out what's the true um, trust uh, we have, we should have in the Europe. So what do they do? So they, they, this system 
relies on social networks, so more particularly in sociograms. Sociograms are what sociologists do when they go into a new society. When, I, when they, in the 30s, when they discovered in Papua New Guinea, this new land where there were many cultures living there with completely unknown languages, nothing was known there. Sociologists arrived there with a piece of paper and a pen, and then basically they started to draw graphs. Like, who cares uh, about someone? Uh, who feeds someone? Who goes together with someone? I mean, so they, you can establish a number of relationships by just observing the interactions between uh, people. So, in a context of e-commerce, uh, there is something that is usually public and that you can get is who trades with whom, for instance. Who signs contracts with whom? This is something that you may know uh, in, any, in any market. So you, here you see the arrows. These are kind of sellers and buyers. Uh, the round people, I think, are buyers, and the non-round people are sellers. So what they are is buying, buying products from one uh, another, uh, according to these arrows. Okay. You, can, you can build something like that. You can also uh, think about cooperation. So in the same way that you would go to Papua New Guinea and see who cares about whom, so you can see whether there is cooperation. Cooperation you can detect by people, for instance, in an e-commerce setting. When someone runs out of a product, the others give product to that guy so he cannot uh, uh, run out of this particular supply. So you can kind of detect the cooperation uh, among, uh, among participants. Similarly for competition. You can see that there are uh, people buying the same product to another guy, and so they are competing to get the best price. They participate in auctions to get products from a particular seller. So you can also detect who is competing with whom. Okay, so this is in an e-commerce setting. In other settings, you could imagine similar sociograms that could be built, and that could be the source of information you might use to avoid having false information and incomplete information. In which way? It will just try and tell you. So the idea uh, of regret of this uh, trust uh, system is to group agents that have frequent interactions among them and consider them as a single source of information, of reputation values. So those that interact along among themselves, I want to group them and ask only one of them. That's the idea. It will avoid the correlated evidence problem because we said those that co interact a lot then they will have a similar opinion. 